I am Awata Kairi, Dr. Kevin Washington, and we are doing the Pan-African Leadership Center, where we discuss various topics that impact the African world from a very intellectual, but also a practical standpoint. We bring in people that have an expertise in understanding the African condition and how to use it to elevate the African purpose and to move the African genius to a new level. This is the brainchild of, Dr. of Daniel Mabonu, of Nairobi, Kenya. This is the Pan-African Leadership Center. And today we have with us Dr. T. Owens Moore, a brother who I know as a scholar at Morehouse University, as he was a department chair, he has moved all over the country doing great and wonderful things currently at Clark Atlanta University in the United States. He is a preeminent scholar of understanding the impact and the power of melanin. So we will talk about melanin and its influence on African consciousness. But we also talk about the issue of African consciousness on, uh, and how it impacts the entire world. So I'm going to uh, bring in uh, Dr. Uh, Moore, and he will tell you about who he is and what he does. And once you hear uh, about him, I am sure that you will be as impressed with him as I am. I'm, I'm honored to call him uh, my brother uh, uh, from another <laughs> Uh, but I want to also note that I call him a, a colleague and uh, someone I truly uh, admire uh, tremendously. Dr. Moore, to let people know around the world, those who don't know about the powerful work that you're doing and, and who you are uh, in this space of African reality. Well, Hotep, my brother, I thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, you, you and your crew have uh, created this platform to reach the world to make some changes. Uh, so it's an honor to be in this presence and this opportunity to kind of share my you know, background and my knowledge on the topic of uh, melanin and African consciousness. Uh, for me, uh, I'm trained as a biological psychologist, but I didn't start out that way. I just started as a brother from the hood, just like, you know, we all are not knowing too much about our history and our culture. So, so I as a student in graduate school, I started to try to put things more together about this topic on melanin. But then prior to, prior to graduate school, I was in undergraduate school. And so with this uh, platform here, then with the Pan-African Leadership Center, Pan-Africans. You know, I went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. So when you ask about, well, who am I? Well, I'm from Pennsylvania. I went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And a great Pan-Africanist went to Lincoln University. Uh, I'm not sure you have heard of uh, Kwame Nkrumah. So Africa must unite. And that's what you're talking about on this platform. So Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Namdi Ezekiwe, uh, these are Pan-Africanists that came over to the United States and went to the HBCUs. So didn't really understand the importance of that as an undergraduate student. But then as we moved on and we went to graduate school, we become a little bit more uh, diversified in our understanding about what's going on in politics. So I left there, went to Howard University. And in Howard University, I was able to dialogue with uh, colleagues from all over the planet, really, and had opportunity to, you know, course through Dr. Welsing's work, Dr. Francis Crest Welsing, and she's talking about the ISIS papers and this crest theory of color confrontation and the whole topic of melanin kept coming up. And my area is biological psychology. So I said, well, you know what, let me explore this a little bit further, a little deeper. And then that's when I started getting into the brain. And so in 1995, I wrote a book called The Science of Melanin. Dispelling the Myths, wrote that with Beckham House Publishers, and that was my primer, not as the only book out there, but it was a book to put things in perspective about the importance of melanin, not just in our skin, but in our brain and in our organs, and how really it's connected to the cosmos. I mean, there's a reason why nature is very important to us as a people. So then I went ahead and wrote about another book called uh, Dark Matters, Dark Secrets. I went a little bit more into the brain, a little bit more into the pineal gland. On the issue of drug effects. So I wrote that in 2002. So when we fast forward life, uh, there's, a, there's a crew. You heard of Richard King, African origins of biological psychiatry. Uh, you yes. heard of Ann Brown, Sister Ann Brown, Dr. Ann Brown. She's uh, retired from Medgar Evers College. And then Brother Bruce Bynum, Edward Bruce Bynum, wrote African Unconscious. We all put together this document called Why Darkness Matters, The Power of Melanin in the Brain. And we actually revised that and have that out right now. Yes. For a new version 
much better than what was on Amazon because that whole Amazon piece can be a little game. So we need to be able to control our our work and our publications. Uh, two years ago, I wrote a book called Pigment Power. Topics on melanin science and health to go a little bit more further in terms of updated research on what's really happened with this topic and the story on melanin. And the reason why I was writing all this is because we need to understand us as a people. As I've traveled the world and seen where we are, we're in trouble. But why are we in trouble? Because we have this self-hate. We have this, this hatred for ourselves because we've been taught that blackness and color is bad. No, it's beautiful. Without pigment, you don't have any power. From the food items we can consume and eat to our bodies without it. And we see all of this global warming with the sun shining and now destroying certain things in the environment. Guess what? Your melon becomes your power to maintain. So for me, uh, I have an opportunity to teach. He said I went to Morehouse University. Actually, it's Morehouse College. And it's interesting because at Morehouse College, I taught your brother. What? That's why I say we kind of like brothers from another mother. Like, right? You know, so I got a chance to teach a brother at Morehouse College. I left there. I went to Clark Atlanta University. I've also been at Fayetteville State University. So now I'm back in the Atlanta University Center providing some knowledge for the people. And some of the topics we discussed, we'll discuss today. We uh, I get a chance to speak to the students about in the classroom. Brother, thank you so much. You're right. It is uh, Morehouse College. Uh, we have this uh, effect sometimes when we go places, we actually change the names. One, one day, out of the day that Bethune Cookman College became a university, I was actually speaking on that college campus. So maybe maybe the, college, the university is on this, on this way. It actually, no I have been put in motion, but it was amazing how I was, I was talking. I was, they unveiled uh, uh, the, the, big, the big banner. So I wanted to uh, delve into this this work. So, the, I mean, you are an accomplished author talking about this idea of melanin and how we actually grow up learning to hate our pigment. Uh, and that really is where the power is. I love the title, Pigment Power. Uh, speak more about this idea of self-hatred and how, as we deal with this idea of self-hatred, how we move away from our true uh, power. Well, we know from our jegnas that have come before us, like Dr. John Henry Clark talked about powerful people do not teach powerless people how to take their power away from them. So the only way you can create an environment where those people don't have any power is to what make them hate themselves, make them despise themselves. So we're not even going to use and say the enslavement process or slavery. No, nah, we were imprisoned. Our minds have been have been shackled, incarcerated. So we're stuck on thinking nothing but bad about black people. So when we don't have our own venues such as this to put out information that portrays us in a positive manner, can't win. Become brainwashed. I think I got a book up here called Brainwashed by mm. Tom Burrell. So our inferiority has been generated. So it's up to us to redefine that. And you as a past president of ABCI, Association of Black Psychologists, and your work, you have something called PST, PEST, it's PAN, was it POST? What was it, what's PEST stand for? Uh, persistent Enslavement Systemic Trauma. So that's what we're dealing with. <laughs> and we've been told that we're nobody, nobody. And now when we start to look that we are somebody, other people fear that. It's not a matter of talking about superiority and we're better than other people. No, it's about it's about understanding your magnificence. And you can only understand that when you know yourself. That's why when you go to Africa, you go to the go to the temples and you see it on the top written in the middle of the terror, Know thyself. They knew that way back then. They understood blackness. Kemet, Kemet means what land of the blacks. So for us as an African people and as I've I got a chance to travel the world, and then we go back to Africa. You see, sometimes with that colonialized or colonized education, many people don't know about our history, don't know about our culture. So in the midst of describing the importance of melanin and pigmentation, we then got, we have to talk about history. And our history has been, you know, shoveled and, and piled on with dirt. So we now must uncover that. And that's what we do as black psychologists. Powerful. I want... I want you said something about uh, incarceration. We often use the languaging of, of enslavement and, and all other, other things. And in, in reality, uh, this idea of being prisoners of war and incarceration. And I have never seen uh, a, a single, and I work with several brothers who that, that, that have been incarcerated and sisters. I've never seen them go back uh, with a, gr a great degree, degree of pride and say, this is where uh, I used to make 
uh, bags or make uh, pens or desks when they go back to the prison. They never go back to the prison like that. Like this is a place of pride and dignity. We have this this relationship with our space of incarceration as if it is a, it is some place to uh, adorn. In reality, we recognize that we are prisoners of war. That changes the entire conversation and the war uh, for what? And one of the things is to uh, to capture and utilize our power for the economic gain and other gain gains that that, that population can get. And so we don't have that gain. And so this is why your work is just, is, is just profound. Because it talks about uh, melanin and um, the power. The book Dark Matters, I think, is is, is powerful because it has even the the metaneta of the what what the Europeans call hieroglyphs on the cover, showing that this is an ancient conversation about uh, the sun, uh, the what we consume, and our divine power. And this is a thing that I think that that is an imperative for the Europeans or the others to make us uh, despise our divine power, divinity, while at the same time they use our divinity right. for the economic gain. And then we have what? We have the issue of, uh, of uh, 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 white uh, money, white finances, black labor. And so we, uh, but, but but speak more to that because uh, right, right now I'm getting excited because people are speaking to us all around the world from Nigeria. Uh, we get in the, of course, the, the greetings. We get in wild, great. Uh, sister said that she needs to uh, share this information with the uh with the African Union group. And so people are really getting charged about the, the contents. Uh, so so share about this idea of yeah. how well, ancient I, this is. Mm. Yeah, and uh, just the whole issue idea. Our ideas have been incarcerated. So when we say conceptual incarceration, we're really saying that people's mindsets have been locked in the way that white people have told you to think about yourself. The only way to get out of that is to start reading and having information and knowledge. So books become weapons. I mean, I'm excited. There's a brother named uh, Chike Akua. He's got a book called uh, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations. And in one of the chapters, he has both you quoted and me quoted. Well, this brother is also a, a teacher transformer. So just the opportunity for us to start redefining things and re reclaiming who we are becomes the start. And most people are scared to start. Why? Because people living in fear. So beyond us being incarcerated and living in fear, look at the opposition. They know that you cannot be inferior. If you were so inferior, then they wouldn't have to create laws to keep you back. They know that, that is when we say they. The opposition knows the power within you. That's why they don't want you organized. When I say about Kwame Nkrumah, we talk about Namdi Zikwe, all the Pan-Africanists that came before us as we're talking today, they were talking about uniting. Well, how do you unite when your mind is fragmented? So we as psychologists do whatever we can to get people to start thinking in the positive direction to start looking at how do we coalesce. So as we're speaking and people are from, from the Congo to Gambia to, you know, Kenya, I mean, the brother said Daniel deals with Mind Matters. He's got a book called Mind Matters, a resource guide to psychiatry for black communities, a black mental health, unapolog unapologetic guide to black mental health. We must navigate our minds through this mess that we've been dealing with. Wow. You can't You can't count on anybody else. You know, I mean, you, you know, Mulana Karinga, Mulana yes. Karinga helped, you know, start this uh festivity we have called Kwanzaa, but he talks about the white man is guilty for what we are not. We are responsible for what you ought to be. Hmm. So we must take the time to read. And as I tell my students, how are you going to tell your children to read when you're not reading? Hmm. There becomes the start to what opening your mind and becoming uh, uncarcerated. Mm, I told y'all this brother, preeminent scholar, he just pulls out book after book, uh, reading, uh, delving into the idea of African consciousness. Uh, witness uh, Fun Kamo says uh, self hate is. I want you to get your comment on this. Self hate uh, is a mental is mental retardation, and it is influenced by the by the white supremacy I agenda, and that that is the lack of our own mental foundation institutes. Uh, look, we are dependent on the oppressor's money. And his money is our submission. And that is an illness that can only be fixed by uplifting the consciousness of the conscious Africans ourselves. We must fund ourselves. The problem 
is that we depend on the oppressor's funding. Hashtag mm. the Arbalek win. So, uh, so uh, or Kebalani. So, what do you think about that? You say that that we are dependent. Go ahead. Yeah, but but this platform is the start to become independent. Without these platforms, we are not going to be able to be free. So, you said you want to talk about the Yoruba movement and what happened there with Omawali Om Yeshatali and what happened with the government attacking that black organization that also has white people in it. It's not like white people and black people can't work together, but the mission has to be for freedom, not for some people to still control you while you so-called getting your getting your uh, chance to be free. So the government attacked that black organization. And for those that are outside of America, they don't know about COINTELPRO, about the government's counterintelligence program to ensure we don't have any black connections between those on the continent and those on the United States, primarily United States, because COINTEL Pro dealing with the counterintelligence program from here. But when you start linking up, you start making connections and now putting your money in your own circle, that's what the European powers and now we got the Asian powers fear. Asia's all up in Africa right now. Asia's all up in South South America right now. Those people who are megalomaniacs or one wanting to control the world and dominate, they're putting their money in resources. Africa has all the resources. We've been told to look away from Africa. Be scared to talk about Africa. Scared to talk about blackness. But non or melanin recessive people all up in Africa taking the resources from the days of what King Leopold and what is his name? Frank, what's his name? Cecil Rose. From those days to the day now with China's now or doing in, in on the continent. So certainly there's some development going on, but what is behind the development? Because we see all the storylines about the uh, problems with the cultural disconnect between those foreigners coming into the black community and dictating what should be happening, what should be done. Right. So until we are in that position from platforms like this, it's not going to happen. So this is a, an act of self-determination you say right now uh that counters what what money was saying very good so we do have to do more around the resource uh, development uh chike akua just came back from from uh from from ghana and last week we a uh, week ago so we had J joshua mapanga uh, out of uh zimbabwe he talks about the same thing about how do we control our economic wealth. And so we've also had Brother TK here uh, with us. And so uh, he's talked about the issue of education and enlightenment and human transformation. And you're right, the resources of the world, the tea that the queen drinks today uh, for, in England has come uh, probably from Madagascar, from the continent, the, the cocoa conversation. Uh, Hershey's chocolate makes uh, in one quarter what uh, the country of Ghana will make uh, on, in an entire year on cocoa so and there has been a control conversation just this week about how they're going to control the economics of that because the cocoa prices uh can be regulated or regulated at the at the docks but there's never been a reduction in the cost of, of a chocolate candy bar in the united mm -hmm. states so they suppress uh what they will pay for cocoa but they never change what they will uh, how they how much they charge also the same thing for coffee so these things are are transformative pieces but the point is that the wealth of the world primarily comes from the continent colton and tantalite and so forth and so on that makes the cell phones operate and so these things are are, are, are important to know dr dia flager says that uh, yes conceptual incarceration let's reclaim uh, who we are uh she's also one of the one of the administrators with with uh, black mental health matters folks y'all see this brother uh reaches back pulls the books out uh, uh a scholar I talked about our various scholars uh, and uh, I talked about Edward Bruce Bynum, talked about Richard King, uh, talked about Barbara Brown. He talked about these these scholars. Also, he's alluded to, of course, Dr. Wade Nobles. And we've mentioned those, those uh, scholars before and what's happening around us. It is imperative for us to know, to do the work. He talked about the counterintelligence program, COINTEL Pro, a, pro a project that was designed to disrupt uh, the economic and intellectual development of a population. And I also talked about the Uhuru movement that was uh, accused of being associated with uh, uh, Putin and Russia because uh, because Russia is somehow <laughs> deemed to be uh, mm -hmm. the one person's enemy. And so the question is, are they joined together? This is the same thing that happened with with our uh, 
uh, uh, uh, various scholars when they started the Greek other organizations back in the day in the 20s so forth uh, um, when they deemed that any African or black person that was talking about uh, black consciousness was tied mm -hmm. to uh, this idea of of the uh, of communism so the conversation has, is old yeah. but the attack is on the powerful and when we mm -hmm. recognize the power and this is where you are recognize the power that that's within then we can move forward so but talk about this idea of the uhuru, uhuru movement just going in and just wreaking havoc on the black community just because yeah i, I want to that the, the issue of e and economics because that will tie into what we're talking about right now so you heard of walter rodney right walter rodney wrote uh how europe undeveloped africa uh and then well, walter rodney's book how Europe underdeveloped Africa. We can't look at Africa as backwards. It's backwards because somebody made it backwards. Africa has all the resources. So economically, E, economics, we need to start studying those, those realms where we have not been in. So here in America, for those that don't know, we have then how capitalism underdeveloped Black America. That's by Manning Marable. So there's, there's documents, there's resources that explain why we seem to be going backwards. So rather than playing basketball on all these ball games, we need to look at ways that we can now study economics, study uh, metallurgy, study or architecture, study things that deal with building, not ball games. Because we get sucked into doing these things that are, we, we are, we're fantastic at psychomotor skill development. We talked about it in Melanin. We can do all those things from soccer, football, to basketball, running track. But we need to translate that to what we need to do to build pyramids again, to what create and build again. So when we deal with this Yoruba movement and what happened where they got attacked, look at the scenario of this. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Hmm, what does that mean? What are we talking about? Russia really has not been an enemy to Africa. Russia, could help, Russia helped fund some of those movements for independence. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Russia, Cuba. Cuba can't be an enemy to black people. Cuba with Castro. Yeah, there's got some black problems in, in Cuba. I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Carlos Moore. Wrote a book called uh, Pichon. Uh, he also wrote a book called Castro and the Blacks. So Castro and the Blacks, I mean, yeah, there's some challenges with black people anywhere. But Cuba was on the side of the African countries for independence. So we're talking about a scenario where we need to look at these places that are not bad and enemies to black people. That's, that's why then this platform becomes important because places like Venezuela is not bad to black people. But the way the government here in the United States pushes that, they like that's the enemy. No. Hugo Chavez, in the, if you did not know the whole, what he did for oil for Africa, Haiti, even the United States, Sitgo, gas, gas, uh, you know, company, helped to provide funding for those people who were less advantaged or disadvantaged. So we can't look at all these enemies of the United States as our enemies because some of them have been at the forefront of helping us gain our independence and our freedom. And so the attack on the Yoruba movement was some trumped up charges saying that, oh, they were dealing with Russia. Like Russia is the problem. Like Russia is when the reality is the United States is doing the same thing that Russia has been doing. When you look at the African countries that have been attacked by the United States under a black man's watch, a black leader was killed in Africa. I'm sure you know the name. Libya. Muammar Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi was giving money to this nation Islam years ago. The United States government said, don't you take that money? Wow. They got enough power to tell an organization don't take some money from a foreign government. And the United States ends up killing that leader. That's why we have to look at this dynamic of, of geopolitics. So with Walter Rodney doing how Europe undeveloped Africa, you know, he was attacked and killed for writing that work or doing that work, doing that kind of work. Because he's trying to change the dynamics of how the structure of our continent and us as people are working together. So if we don't then take the time to do the work to make that happen, we will, will continually to be what? influenced and manipulated and and out the game and the game's going to change 
how is it that China now has fast forwarded and now they're over in Africa doing all these things? The game has changed. After World War II with Japanese being defeated, how they now control Panasonic, Mitsubishi, Nissan? How do they control all that? How does that happen? But Africa is still backwards. So I bet you, and we can say it here on the Pan-African Leadership Conference about documenting that Ukraine will be redeveloped before anything happens in Africa. A war is going on right now. I bet you that place will be redeveloped before anything happens in Africa. That lets you know that there's an enterprise to keep black people and those of melanin dominance in a hole. No one's going to save you. Dr. Clark used to always say, looking in the mirror, that's your only friend. <laughs> that's your only friend. Wow. So we must what re-educate ourselves, and it doesn't start by uh, waiting someone else to tell you about your history. You better go gather it yourself. Mm, do for self. So uh, this, you all have a, a library uh, to develop. Uh, Dr. Owens has pulled out, um, or has pulled out the, a plethora of books, right? So uh, Walter Rodney is an author you need to look for. Uh, who else? Let's, that, let's go through that list because you just keep pulling them out. Manning Marable. I mean, he... he Manning Marable, yes. Transformed that book, the topic to how capitalism underdeveloped Black America. You know, uh, Hugo Chavez, I mean, again, study, study Venezuela. United States government went ahead and had several coups against this brother. They had several coups against Castro. They always have a coup against someone who's going against the grain of the American empire. Hmm. That's why I'm saying that enemy of my enemy is my friend. Hmm. So we got to start looking at those, those power play, the chess politics. You mentioned uh, about economics of Claude Anderson, poweronomics, right? I mean, we got the, the list is there. And for those who don't have time to read, okay, fine, get to work. For those that are telling you about the dynamics, get to work. That means that whole, if you self-hatred, you haven't talked about him, but Amos Wilson passed away in the mid nineties, but Amos Wilson blueprint for black power. You, you got, you know about that. I mean, indeed, the blueprint for black power, a moral and political and economic imperative for the 21st century, hmm. 800 pages. The brother already did the work. I think he should have got a, I don't want to say Nobel peace prize There's other prizes that we should be given, but, He's already done the work. So where are we at right now? Right, Waiting for right. something to happen? Right. Nah, we have to what? Uh, he, he talked about self-hatred. I, I got that on another bookshelf there, but he has a book called Self-Defeat and Self-Hatred. I think they put that out after he had passed because, you know, he has his own publishing company called African World Info Systems. They said you have this, this your own platform here. Unless we have our own platforms, it's not going to happen. It's going deep, right? So uh, the work, uh, the, the blueprint of black power, as a matter of fact, I was in uh, finishing my, my dissertation, my, my doctoral work in D.C., and I had met uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, and I told him that I was going to come and work with him on, on his latest project. I didn't, know, I didn't know really what it was. Right. And so he had called me up uh, when I was about to comp uh, just, just get out of the doctoral program altogether. And I don't even spirit, because he, he, did, he did not know we had one or two conversations when he came to DC. Right. Uh, he would not have known that I'd gone through a, a hellacious day on that day. And the phone call came through and he says, Brother Washington, you got to do this. And he gave me a list of things that I needed to do. Awesome. And then, and then uh, probably a month or so later, uh, he uh, made his transition, which I thought, I thought was powerful, right? The idea that his brother drop seeds, like spirit yeah. gonna say, hey, do this. And then you're just going to just roll out on me. Come on, man. So, yeah. so, uh, but, but the point is that uh, these uh, scholars have laid out the points, the PowerPoints, the, the movements that we need to make. And we are afraid to do that or something is happening. Maybe it is self-hatred. Maybe it's something else. Uh, but we must recognize that the reason why the enemy continues to come after us and attack us is because they haven't won yet. And they haven't yeah. won because what they're coming against is more powerful than they. And they know this. Uh, how do we get the chance to know more about this? So, Dr. Moore, here we are to remind uh, us, all of us, to keep reminding us of, about the power that's really within us. Mm -hmm. And uh, and how has your work uh, uh, elevated that particular consciousness? And what is the connection uh, to melanin and super nutrients and, and this power uh, to the this political power? Talk, share more yeah. about that. Yeah, that's a lot of pack, a lot of, a lot of information packed in this little short time I had to spend with you. But the uh, people all over the world reading my book have uh, said it's helped them out to know a little more about themselves. It's only written in English, but we need to be in that space where we have our work in other languages. 
I spent time in uh, Salvador, Brazil, and got a chance to ste- speak at the Steve Biko Institute. And I was teaching the students about history and culture. And of course, they're, they speak Portuguese, so they're trained to think like the Portuguese. So their mindset was not focused on what a middle passage was and what melanin is and how great they have been in the past before this issue of something called slavery or the imprisonment. So as I've gone around the world and people are, are interested in the work, I feel as though I've made a contribution. And so when I leave this planet, the legacy is still there for the work to be passed on because nothing that I've done is the epitome. It's what the stepping stone. I've got a brother brother in England uh, named um, uh, Leon Marshall. He wrote a book called my book it called the hidden science of melanin and so for his book he's kind of uh going off of what my work has done i can't find but the hidden science of melanin powerful brother but he's taking my work to another level so for me in reaching the community it's all about understanding that without the melanin in the brain you're not thinking properly we have diseases that show when the melanin is deteriorating in your brain you got some neurodegenerative problems. So what I'm saying, when you can see a person and the problems that exist when the melanin is lacking, what happens when the when you pump up the volume? You start slamming basketballs like we do. You start running football. You start doing things on the soccer field like you just do dance and look at gymnastics today, almost dominated by African woman or melanin dominant woman. I can't say just African, but reality we're all African. So we're talking about a scenario where the brain becomes the core and without the brain functioning, nothing else happens. So we've already talked about incarceration with the mind, but look at the biology of it and the science. And no one's talking about superiority. We're just talking about the engines revving at a certain state that makes you what? Glide and go fastest, the quickest, the you know, all those things happen because the way the brain operates. So as I get a chance to speak to people about that, document it not from what i'm saying but from the research someone's got to put it together so i just put the research together for people to understand this you know your work reminded me of something uh when i understood the power of colton or tantalite Mm -hmm. and it is the fastest conducted metal known to man right one of that's why they keep putting it in these cell phones and putting it into the computers and I think about whatever is on the ground, uh, under the ground was over the ground. And so when we, when our bodies go return to the earth, then whatever is in that metal is within us. And so your work just reminds me of this, the idea that, that we have this in us and the world recognizes this, but we don't recognize it. No, not at uh, all. <laughs> and so, so uh, I, I thank you for that. So that's part of a lecture that I give is that I, I, I draw it right back to your work. There it is, right? The hidden science. Of melanin. Go ahead. A brother, a brother over in England took my work, took it to another level. He has a whole academy. Since this is an international program here, platform, he has the hidden science academy.com. So he's promoting my work. So I'm here to promote his work. I got another sister you asked about the whole uh perception on food items. She's written a book called Melon Guide to Spiritual Awakening. She's also supported my work and she's a nutritionist. Uh people have done the work. It's what are we going to do to now make it manifest, to make it materialize? So as we start studying ourselves, we start to understand, guess what? Mm, I'm not just a jiggaboo in a corner drinking a 40 ounce. Mm, I have more power. You know what? All these things we're seeing on the TV with the superheroes and all that, we're superheroes in real life. The story about Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, not nah, y'all Santiwa, those are superheroes in real life. You know, so we start looking at studying the power of what people have done in the past, not just the beat downs that people have taken. You start standing a little bit different. The Deacons for Defense, you know, I got that down here somewhere. Deacons for Defense, Robert, Robert uh, Williams, Negroes with Guns. When you start to see stories that say, you know, you didn't get beat down all the time, that you actually stood up and fought. It changes your whole dynamic. The melanin recessive people aren't going to teach you that. I mean, that's why the Dr. Carter G. Woodson, Miss Education of the Negro, you know, got that up there. You know, got that one. Yeah. <laughs> that's Carter G. Woodson, Miss Education of the Negro, is explaining that, you know, 
he he didn't want to stay in the school systems. He had to do something outside the school system because he saw what they were doing to keep people's minds shackled. So it's up to us to do that. We can't depend upon anybody else to tell us that. You said melanin deficient people cannot teach us how to liberate ourselves. They would They're melanin not. deficient. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Don't have it. Uh, and we keep looking to them to get to resolve this. This is the Pan-African Leadership Center uh, where we talk about the issues of Pan-African reality, a liberation, uh, and the uh, notion of knowing that we are a powerful people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Moore, there's a question here that says, yeah. what is the greatest action or contribution or support that can benefit Africa either internally or externally? So I don't know if they can tie it into something, but I just want well, you to know that, that there is a conversation. Go ahead. I see that one word internal. Guess what? Internal reparation. Hmm. We deal with reparations on the issue of other governments should be paying for what they have done to countries from what Britain did to their empire to what happened with Haiti. Now they had to end up paying reparations to or fund France for what happened, but they should have gotten reparations. So internal reparations is the greatest action and contribution that can be done, because as you change yourself, everything around you changes. So I would focus on that first, because if you don't change, the circumstances around you aren't going to change. So let's focus on internal reparations. Elaborate on that. I was I was working on something, right? The internal reparations. Yeah. Uh, uh, share more about that. that that's it, right? That, that's you ever heard of Mata organization in the past? Uh, a brother named Kenneth uh, Ken Bridges. He and a couple of people took this topic of. How do we get our money spent with us? So how do you do that first? Well, you got to got to support yourself first. So the Mata organization and this brother, he was assassinated by that D.C. sniper. Wow. He was a set. There was like 20 people killed. He happened to be one of them. I don't know. I just have to ask the question. How he happened to be in Virginia? He's from Pennsylvania. He had to get assassinated. But he pushed internal reparations because he was talking about how we need to change internally first to appreciate us to be able to support African initiatives. How are you going to support African initiatives if you don't like Africa? You don't like black people? You're going to run from yourself. So that's why I wrote an article called A Blueprint Power Analysis of the Buffoonery of Black Conservatives. So say the, say wrote, the title again. Say that that, 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 was, that was a good one. It's the Journal of African Studies. You can check it out. I wrote it in 2013, but a blueprint power analysis of the buffoonery of black conservatives. As Dr. Wilson would always talk about, what, are, what are you conserving? What, what is a black and being conservative? You, you, we got some problems. You can't be conserving. We have to what get out of this. But they're utilized by the system with their polysyllabic terminology and like you know they're great orators and but those people are propped up but not doing the work in the community i'm not saying anything bad about those that work at pwis i mean that's where they want to work but then it's like you're in that situation and then how do you now talk about the one who's funding you who's, or paying you it's kind of the challenge so the hbcu experience and the opportunities to have this pan-african leadership center uh, you got the brother you interviewed him over in Ghana, uh, Cambon, right? Doing his own thing over there. We have the templates. How do we now make it manifest? It starts with internal reparations. If you don't appreciate and love yourself, how are you going to support yourself? You said uh, for those who may not be familiar, we talk about PWIs, which is predominantly white institutions in the United States and HBCUs, historically black colleges and the universities. And there is a legacy of these institutions starting in HBCUs. And many of them uh, started out of the uh, desires and interest and the intellect of African people, realizing that they had the capacity to learn in a space where Europeans were saying that they were ineducable. Uh, many of them began to expand after what was called the Mohawk Conference of 1890. Uh, and uh, this, the, 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 the preamble of the Mohawk Conference, if I could call it such, suggested that slavery uh, moved the savage African up the ascent of humanity and that to educate him would be uh, further mm -hmm. up that ascent. And so even the, pre uh, the, the, the thinking of that particular Mohawk Conference was jacked up. But W.B. Du Bois says that in this country, in the United States, uh, largely the idea of public education for all is a Negro idea. And it comes from the ancient understanding of African people about the capacity 
to learn and to know as well as to be. So in reality, the foundation of education in this country not only is predicated on the, the immediate conversation of African people uh, that were in, incarcerated in this space, but also we know that the liberating arts comes out of the ancient conversation of ancient Kemet. So my, the point I want to make sure that everybody understands that HBCU and what it is and what's happening, that, that, that these are black schools that started, many of them were uh, all corner, was bought, land was, was uh, 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 procured by enslaved Africans to start it. Uh, um, uh, Prairie A&M University was a plantation that the plantation owner's wife gave the land to the enslaved uh, uh, to do. Uh, actually, they didn't give it to them. They actually had worked for it, right? Uh, but 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 had t turned over the land for them to be educated. So many of our centers, uh, spaces where we educated in this space in the United States, are spaces that were liberated by African people trying to carve out, working to carve out a space to further develop uh, the minds of brilliant people. However. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the uh, so-called uh, PWIs were what was, was part of a land grant process, the Morrill Act, that gave them land, Penn State and other places that gave them land that was stolen from Native Americans. So think about the idea of a, of a self-determining people saying we will affirm who we are, we will educate ourselves, we will elevate ourselves, and we will start our own institutions, whereas uh, Europeans, white folks, were given land that was stolen uh, from the indigenous population. And then they want to suggest then that people of African descent own welfare. And as a matter of fact, they're the benefactors of, of, of procured stolen property, stolen goods, thieves, and that that was a welfare system that gave them much of what they call their systems of operation. Just want to talk about this so people can be clear about, about what we're talking about. The, the, uh, I, you know what? And this is this was not on the list, and we and you cannot talk about it. But uh, uh, there was this this uh, white guy at Tennessee State University that actually yelled out uh, at a, a black student, and uh, I was curious. I asked my students about what what they thought about it and how they were not able to delve into the conversation because I think that we're afraid of the race conversation. But I want you to 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 share something if you do, if you have some thoughts about uh, this conversation about. Uh, this white male at a HBCU talking down uh, a black person, a black student. And on top of that, how this behavior is often protected in right. HBCUs uh, because of something. Yeah, uh, I did see that uh, interesting dynamic. I would like to, since we're dealing with Pan-African, though, my experience, I when I was in Brazil, I spoke at the Steve Biko Institute. Now, Steve Biko is from South Africa. South Africa is not South America. South Africa is on the bottom of Africa. So the people in Brazil appreciated enough of what Steve Biko did as a Pan-Africanist there in South Africa. Because you know one of the most powerful quotes from Steve Biko is that the most powerful tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So the people in Brazil never been to South Africa to meet Steve Biko's or that whole family. So when I was in Brazil, I made the connections. And then when I went to South Africa, I actually got a chance to meet Winnie Mandela and her family. Why? Because her student was in my, her granddaughter was in my class, Zazawe. Wow. So when I went to go to South Africa, she said, hey, you want to meet my grandmother? I didn't know that was a grandmother when she was in my, as a student in my class. So I then got a chance to meet the family. And I told them about me working in Brazil at the Steve Biko Institute. And they didn't know nothing about that. So I made the connection for Steve Biko's uh, son to go to give a anniversary address in Brazil. That's the connection of us controlling our institutions. In Brazil, they don't have an opportunity to have HBCUs. They could. There's a brother named uh, Joe Beasley who has an institute there in I think like not Sao Paulo but another school that he's provided money that's almost like an HBCU but the melanin dominant people there in Brazil don't have easy access to going to the university systems. So the Steve Beagle Institute was created to help them to do better on the test to get into the university system. But if they had their own HBCUs over there, it wouldn't be a problem. But Brazil has fought affirmative action. They got rid of affirmative action. Guess what? We're dealing with the same argument right now in the United States. So if you say there's a white professor that was screaming at that student, some people feel privileged that these, these little Students, these little, I don't give them negative names, they don't they can't learn anyway. So they feel privileged to be able to do anything in that environment. And so many of our HBCUs are no longer 
HBCUs in the tradition of them being controlled and dominated by us. So when you have infiltrators coming in, those dynamics can happen where you saw that situation where that professor was doing that for years. <laughs> Just happened to be on what tape now because people can now video anything. But some people have had a privilege to think that they can tell anybody what to do. And from a repressive mentality, that's what I'm saying. When Steve Biko said the most powerful tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So when white people are able to teach you that you've done nothing, you have no history, you know what I mean? The brother in there from England, you, you heard of uh, Robert Williams? He wrote a book called uh, Walter Walker, Robert? When yeah. He Ruled. Wow, yes, Dictates. sir. He's doing that over in England, which means someone in Africa can do it. Theophile Benga, you know what I mean? Taking shake at the Diop's works another level. We've already had Ivan Van Serdman here, who's influenced Renoka Rashidi, who may his soul rest in peace. A lot of our scholars are gone, but they've done the work already. So we can't wait on those who don't look like us to teach us correctly. Hmm. This is um, uh, the Pan-African Leadership uh, Center. Viantre Petty has uh, entered into the space. Uh, he's also a, a student uh, of ours at Grambling State University, moving through, making some things happen. And he talks about the issue of, of, of freedom of speech, and he knows about the dynamics that happened there. And the reason why it's Pan-African conversation, because we know that many of the Pan-Africanists uh, uh, came to our institutions, came to the United States to study. Uh, we know about Kwame Nkrumah uh, coming to study and others uh, uh, came to the United States and they saw something and they were inspired by the powerful works. And then we have others in the space disrupting that elevation. And so we have to be vigilant about that because it then uh, I think it's an act of self-hatred that we don't speak out more about these issues, uh, about who we are. We don't see ourselves as a global people. We see ourselves as simply being uh, Negroes uh, still dealing with the issue of plantation life. And so so this is why th this is critical. Uh, Dr. Uh, Moore uh, is here with us. He, a scholar he says that we are covering a lot of territory. It is, it's all about the same thing, about the power of knowing who you are. And when you know who you are, you do differently. And and his work is centered around a melanin, uh, and uh, how we have this 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 chemical within our bodies that we have been attacked for uh, uh, because people don't have it. People have gone out and tried to get it, uh, try to make it appear in their skin. They've gotten uh, skin cancer and all kind of things, trying to figure out how to master the the various elements of melanin, the the uh, neural melanin, and other other parts of other types of melanin that exist. And so it's important to know that when you walk with the power that uh, we have, it is intimidating to those that uh, don't seem to have that same type of power. Not better than, they're simply saying that there's a unique power. And so we take, you, you mentioned also that we don't have to go look for the superheroes, we have to find the, the made up one uh, because we have them living among us. I do want to articulate that even, even in their myth, their conversation about a Wakanda discourse, uh, there is a truth inside of that myth uh, that, that there is this power, this this conceptual power. And so even their myth acknowledges something, uh, uh, the truth. We have to know both uh, their truth of the myths, but also understand our truth. So, Dr. Moore, yes, this, this is it on you. Uh, you can uh, take it anywhere you want to go. This the, the, the next five minutes are just anything that you want to talk about is shared that that pulls this package together in a way that makes sense to you because people are just, just writing in right now. I, I can't even keep up. Go ahead. Well, the whole issue of consciousness. I mean, that's what life is about. And there's a general universal consciousness out there. But how do you tap into that? So many of our scholars and many historians and many people from different cultures have dealt with the issue of meditation, uh, yoga, uh, ways that you can channel your body to reach that divine universal consciousness. Well, the body is the vehicle to do that. So on a science level, because we didn't you know, emphasize any science in this discussion because we're gonna make it plain for people to understand. That's why Malcolm X was always a powerful brother. He made it plain for you to understand. So the science of our bodies is what channels us to this universal consciousness. Well, that's about peace and love and being equal, but we're dealing with a system you know, the, the pale fox, you know, written by Grill and Dieterlin about 
the Dogon people, but the pale fox about this entity that has just created havoc all over the world. Another book by this brother named, uh, uh, actually a Native American writer, Jack Forbes, wrote a book, book called Columbus and Other Cannibals. So there's entities out there that are hindering us from being able to be at peace to live for divine universal consciousness. But just consciousness first is just an awareness of your surroundings. And if you are being taught to be other than who you are, there's no way you can have the right consciousness to what move in the right direction. You will always be controlled, and manipulated. You, you asked about, we talked about the, uh, the the issue of resources. If you watch that movie Avatar and you look at the mineral resource that the the so-called sky people were coming down to get, what was it? It was called unobtainium. That's a powerful concept. Concept, even though it's done by a white man in terms of creating the images. Even those little those people in the Avatar, little blue people. With dreadlocks, you know, there's African people. They got a baobab tree there. They got the tree of life. That's African people. They talked about these people in Avatar having these this this pigmentation, not pigmentation, this polymer that makes them move and makes them real agile. But the reality of the resource that those Europeans were going in there, those sky people trying to get, was called unobtainium. Hmm. You talk about Africa with the cell phones. Without the Colton, cell phones don't work. So resources, when you have the right resources mentally, oh, you can elevate and grow and build and do whatever you want. When you're being miseducated and uh, taken away from uh, what your reality really is, guess what? Your consciousness can never grow. Your awareness will be centered around what someone else is telling you to think. That's why it's up to us. So with this Pan-African you know, leadership center, I mean, pan. Many of my students don't know what pan means. It keeps like pan-Hellenic. Try to sustain to the Greek organizations, not African organizations, but Greek organizations. Pan means together. We must focus on what our African ancestors talked about. Africa must unite. Kwame Nkrumah said it. Kwame Nkrumah, he wrote like 30 books. When I went to the Ghana Center or the Kwame Nkrumah Center in Ghana and I saw all the stuff that was in there. Man, they even had this old mirror from Lincoln University where I went. It's like, I know they don't have no mirror or dresser or something that I used when I was there. So how do they actually do that? But he was well respected throughout the world as a pan-Africanist. We have to focus on that. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi had the little green, the green book about how we now need to make the United States of Africa. So you have many scholars that have been there for us to say and what to do, but we got entities that we're not sophisticated enough to know how they'll attack you because it's all about what the resources money and economics some people you've talked about that as a psychologist with other presenters but that whole dynamic of what's important to you the axiological reference point for europeans is material and things not people that's why gentrification is a problem now and in many communities and environments because they're now wiping the people out to get that property, people versus property. So from a European or melon recessive standpoint, it's gonna be about things and material. African people or people of melon dominant are living to be socially oriented and together. And so we've been manipulated to a point where it's just hard this day in age. And so when we start looking at science principles and start looking at melanin, guess what, melanin is a biological element that absorbs and takes in it harnesses energy and that's what we need to do as black people as african people as melanin dominant people on the planet harness this energy to be able to take our life and our world to a whole another level again build pyramids again if you ever visited kemet you know you've seen it you look at it how did they do this guess what we can do it again Brother, they, uh, um, uh, I mean, that's it, right? Uh, we must recognize that we are people of greatness that we have within us, as Fukia says, uh, the, the biogenetic growth, that we are seed of a seed of a seed of a seed of a seed of the seed, that that is what is within us. And so that genius has never died down. It's simply uh, our awareness of it has been uh, diminished. Uh, so we have to recognize that. Vyantre says, uh, book, uh, I'm not quite sure, Vyantre, which book you wanted to see. 
again, if you can uh, type that in, we can respond to that. Uh, but Dr. Uh, Moore, uh, again, a scholar who's inspired many, uh, has moved many. I know he's moved uh, me uh, to get back to the readings of some books that I have walked away from. I got to go back and return to a, a few and I got to pick up some more. Uh, but the uh, I've been impacted recently by this book here about Africanisms uh, in America. I thought that was so so uh, uh, interesting to actually see and hear the various things that we have done as an African people, like the certain words that are utilized in this space. Okay, I've always asked the question, "What is okay?" And you know that then it's a it's a um, uh, a mendiga word that talks about the issue about everything is copacetic. The idea of swag, those the terminology comes mm -hmm. from African people, right? And so we don't recognize all this stuff as a part of who we are. We also have. Uh, uh, the brother here talking about spirituality and beyond Professor Kaba talk, talks about these various uh, elements of understanding spirituality and beyond and the movement that occurs on the people. You mentioned uh, Brother Bynum. And so uh, uh, this is a book that we're looking through now. Uh, probably won't show it because of the. the Got it. Uh, yeah, Got it. Uh, that on the shelf, too. Yes. Yes. I, I know. I know you got it all. I, I know it's there. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that. So this is important for people to be able to understand that the power to absorb this intellect, the power to not only absorb it, but to be able to manipulate the matter around us to create the unthinkable yeah. is also here. That's the idea of the pyramids. And if we don't know that we have that power, then we believe that we do, that we simply are, are, are niggas, bitches, and hoes, and we're more than that. We've seen them, uh, you talked about Avatar, exactly right, right? The Navi, the Navi got to be, uh, got to be uh, African people, right? Between the Navi being African and it, and uh, the indigenous population to, to this land, I mean, that's nothing else that you could talk about that has that kind of power. So even in their myths, they are they show that they are afraid of the power uh, within African people. The whole uh, conversation around King Kong, uh, mm -hmm. the big black brute uh, that comes to get the white damsel. The issue is that uh, that is a power of Africa that can destroy all that uh, is great and wonderful within the uh, European world. So, so this is, this is it. So what uh, Viantre says, what is the, what is a book that uh, expels the tactics uh, of the enemy? I don't know uh, quite what, what was happening. I've been kissing yeah. uh, Duku Mazzini. Oh man. Wow. Okay. Uh, my good brother, uh, I'm not sure if he's still in Ghana, but he's went to, he left uh, the, the uh, U S and, and started teaching in Dar es Salaam, I believe. Uh, but the brother is uh, is really a heavy, heavy yeah. brother. But go ahead. With that, um, Dr. Welsing focused on Neely Fool's work, a United Compensatory Code System for Studying White Supremacy. I got it on here, but that book, if she's asking what can be done to decode Neely Fuller, N E E L Y, Neely Fuller, F U L L E R. On the on YouTube, people have taken his work, some his chapters, and done like little cartoons on it to kind of break that down for us. So nearly fool's work would be uh, definitely uh, a book to address what the sister asked about. The uh, when you said gene of a gene of a, or seed of a seed of a seed, and gene, so my next work is going to be on epigenetics and genomics. And the word gene, you know what a gene is? It's nothing but mm -hmm. encapsulated memory. Hmm. Mm hmm encapsulated Absolutely. memory yes sir that means in that gene is everything we've done yes sir that's why when you go to kemet and those people that are there taking you on the tours of the pyramids they didn't build those pyramids hmm. they're not the people that's not their genes so when we come back they're like oh brother come welcome back because they know we're the ones that were, were in that hot ass sun you can't <laughs> be light in a hot ass sun and work those were mm -hmm. African or black or Nubian or asphalt black people that were doing and building that. So in the genes is an encapsulated memory of everything we've done. And the oppressor and the colonization has done everything to squash that out of your genes. But it can't be squashed because when you look at everything we've done about um, how we've been organizing and doing things and it just comes out that we keep growing despite there's no reason we shouldn't even be on the planet from what happened to us with this Maafa. We shouldn't even be here. So as the brother said, Amos Wilson emphasized 
encapsulated memory is what genes are all about. Mm, 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 mm. Epigenetics, uh, ep epigenetics, right? There is a people need to understand, right? So epigenetics, I mean, we were not, we were supposed to close out three minutes ago anyway, but this is that this is good. We're going to want to press forward just, just, just a minute or two more. Epigenetics is important to understand that inside of the gene is the memory of how to respond. Uh, what has happened? What has occurred? There's this research done by Diaz and Resler that had the mice, the mice that had the whiff of the orange blossom, and then uh, they would be shocked. And so these mice associated uh, mm -hmm. the the trauma of the shock with the smell that they uh, encountered. And then the, they are, the, these mice would have pups, and the pups would have the whiff of the orange blossom, but not uh, have the shock, and their bodies will have a visceral response. These pups will grow up, and they would have pups, and have the orange blossom smell. And these also had a visceral response uh, to that particular trauma, though they had never been shocked. So inside of the gene is a memory, and the memory uh, teaches a, a great deal. But also, Resler said that there's a way to to teach uh, the, uh, the mice how to respond to that, and that becomes encoded genetically. Uh, and so they show the opposite that. Uh, the mice that had had been traumatized and by the smell begin to uh, be taught how to resolve this particular trauma response, and that response to the trauma was passed down genetically. This is a moment of how do you respond to the trauma, and how do we then re uh, uh, code what has been coded? How do we uh, refashion that? We've learned a great deal from our ancestors, and now so we're just going to add to that conversation. So, so that's a powerful bit of work. Go ahead. I'm just boomerang it back to you because you're the one that deals with persistent enslavement systemic trauma. I mean, it's a it's a pest that keeps bothering us because we're not dealing with, as you said, epigenetics. All these factors, it kind of explains why we're fearful of things. Mm. On the issue of the European or the oppressor, it explains why they're fearful of you. Mm. So yeah, epigenetics. All I'm saying is that that's where the next level of research will be going with my work is to look at the genome, what's really going on with this entrenched uh fear or really not even fear but elegance you know i mean how do we ra rise above rather than always being at this level you know mm -hmm. I mean? we, we see sick students all getting c's man we need to be somebody and get some a's say amen but we see sick <laughs> you know what i mean we we need to look at ways to grow and develop so in our genes is all that you can't know that unless you're taught that mm. brother that there's um i mean i i want to keep you around longer brother because that, that i mean that's that's on point we got we got to dr more we got to continue the conversation the pan-african leadership center uh a preeminent scholar dr t owens moore uh has talked about melanin has talked about the consciousness element talked about uh the power that is within how do we tap into it and is moving into the conversation of how do we recode our DNA? We recognize that we are the seed of a seed of a seed of a seed of the seed, that we recognize that people have come to attack and assault the African genius. And we have the moment to resurrect that uh, genius, to move it forward. And we have brothers like Dr. Moore reminding us uh, that the power that we have is within us and we have to bring it without to create a new reality. Uh, this reality is one that is up to us to do, not to uh, wait on the oppressor. It is an idea of doing for self. Pan-African Leadership Center is just about that conversation. So I thank all of those who have uh, come in, who have joined us, who have come to have the conversation. I want to thank Dr. Moore for uh, his uh, brilliant insight and willingness to do this at this time. I want to thank all those who, who, who uh, uh, tapped in. Abba Kinzie, uh, you need to respond to the email. You need to be on this conversation. You need to hear from this brother. He's, he's heavy. So we will have them. As a matter of fact, we should just put uh, uh, two or three of uh, y'all at the same time and just have a real good conversation about the African world. Uh, Viantre, uh, uh, thank you for joining in, Dr. Flager, and others uh, for being a part of this conversation. Dr. Moore, you want to leave us with something that uh, um, that uh, that we can hold on to, a nugget, and we will close with you. Nuggets, nuggets, kernels. All I got to say is that uh, more power to you, my brother, for uh, being a conduit to make this work. You said that other people have been involved in making this platform uh, available for us. But much love and respect to you. And I would just say Asante Sana to my people. We will win.